guys, my name is Eden Richardson. I'm the Discipleship Director here at First Baptist Church, Rock Hill. Thank you so much for tuning in to our sermon from this past Sunday. We are so excited for you to listen to this message and to hear what God is gonna do for your life as you listen. Uh, be sure to make sure that you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see all future messages as well. And thank you again for tuning in. Good morning, church family. Good to see you. Today we are getting back into the series from Hebrews 11 on faith. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to two places. Hebrews 11, we'll look at two verses, but we'll spend most of our time reading in Genesis starting in chapter 25. So open to both places because you have to look at the story in Genesis to understand, to make sense of what he says in those two verses in Hebrews 11. So open your Bible, Hebrews 11 and Genesis 25. And as you're doing that, I want to thank everyone who attended, participated in yesterday morning's boot camp. Between everyone who was here, the deacons this past Monday night and others, we have about 200 adults in our church who are currently going through training um, on sex abuse, awareness, prevention, and care. And I am so thankful that so many of our volunteers are committed to being the best we can be at knowing how to care for people who've been hurt, how to prevent anyone, especially our children, from ever being hurt, and how to understand these issues. And hopefully as we go by, the majority of our church will have gone through this training, but we're off to a great start, and I am just so very, very thankful. All right, faith. Hebrews 11, this is often called, as many of you know, the Faith Hall of Fame. And he lists all these individuals from the Old Testament who are examples of faith. And we're looking at two verses today in chapter 11 of Hebrews, verses 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21. Let me see your copy of God's Word. You have it, hold it up. Always bring the Bible with you to worship. We study His Word, teach, preach His Word. So Hebrews 11, verses 20 and 21, he says this, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, his grandchildren, and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. Now, when you read this chapter and these examples of faith, you come to these two verses and well, if you know the story of Jacob and Isaac and Joseph, you, you kind of get it. But just those two verses by themselves, you have to ask yourself, what, what are those verses really teaching us about faith? Because all it says is, by faith, Isaac blessed his two boys. And by faith, Jacob, when he was old, blessed Joseph's grandsons. What does that teach you about faith? To understand what he's getting at in these two verses, you have to go back to their stories. So we'll do that right now in Genesis chapter 25. Isaac, as many of you will remember, is the son of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. Marries a beautiful young woman named Rebecca, and a couple of verses in Genesis indicate, man, they loved each other. They really did. She was beautiful. He loved her. He cherished her. They wanted to have a family, but she was struggling to get pregnant, just like some of you. And so her husband prayed for her, went to God and prayed for his wife to have a child. She wanted one, he wanted one. So he goes to God, he prays, God answers their prayers. Rebecca becomes pregnant, but it's not an easy pregnancy. She's pregnant with twin boys. And it's like they're fighting each other in the womb. Any of you parents seen little brothers fight each other? Huh? Any of you brothers fight with your brothers growing up? Well, that's Jacob and Esau, but man, they're doing it in the womb. They're not even born yet, and they're fighting each other. And Rebecca doesn't understand what's going on, so she goes to God and wants an explanation, wants God to give her some direction. And in chapter 25 in the book of Genesis, chapter 25 and verse 23, God answers her. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. These two boys to whom you are giving birth will become the fathers of two different people groups, the fathers of two different nations. And uh, that happened. 
as Jacob became one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, father of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. His twin brother Esau would become the father of the Edomites, the nation of Edom, two different nations, two different people groups. God went on to tell her in this verse, one people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. It was customary in their culture that the firstborn had certain privileges and advantages, but God says, actually, the, the, the twin that's born second is going to have those. So she gives birth to these boys. And it's not just a few minutes after the first that the second comes. They are one right after the other. First comes Esau. He's the firstborn. He's the oldest. And then Jacob comes out of the womb with his hand clutching the heel of his brother Esau. And things just went downhill after that. The parents started out loving each other. But Rebecca and Isaac made a terrible mistake. They started playing favorites. Rebecca, mom, she favored the second born, Jacob. Isaac, the dad, favored the first born, Esau. Now let me ask you do, you, do you think them playing favorites had any impact on their marriage? Do you think them playing favorites had any impact on the relationship between those two boys? It started some family dynamics that, that followed them the rest of their lives. It always does. How can it not? When any child thinks mom or dad loves the other ones more than they love me, you're headed for trouble right away. And that's what happens. That's what happens here. So they're growing up, and uh, you got to understand there are two very important cultural traditions in their world. One is called the birthright. The other is the father's blessing. In their cultural tradition, the birthright meant that the firstborn son, in this case Esau, would be considered the leader of the extended family going forward. And he would receive a double portion of the inheritance. So when dad died, the firstborn Esau, because of the birthright, was to receive twice as much of the inheritance as any other child. Now, that may not sound fair to us. It doesn't really matter because every culture and every age has its own traditions and ways of doing things. You know there are traditions in America that other people in the world think are really ridiculous, just like we think some of the traditions of other places in the world are ridiculous. Every culture has its way of doing certain things. Now, not all of those are good, but it's their way. And that's what's going on here. Nothing more, nothing less. The father's blessing was their tradition that the father would place his hands on his children and speak a blessing before he died. And for them, it was almost as if he was speaking a prophetic blessing, looking at them through the eyes of God and announcing, here are some things God has for you in the future. Now, a father could bless each of his children, some of his children, or only one of his children. Isaac's now an old man. He's a man of faith, made the mistake of playing favorites. But other than that, he's been a good man, a man of faith, a man of God. He's old, getting close to death, <clears throat> and his vision's gone. He's blind, he can't see, he's feeble. And because he knows he's about to die, he says it's time to give his blessings. And following their culture, their tradition, and the fact that Esau was his favorite and the firstborn, he was going to pronounce a blessing on Esau that was a really good blessing. His wife, Rebecca, finds out about this. And she doesn't want that blessing given to Esau. She wants it given to her favorite, Jacob. And so Jacob and his mom work together scheming to trick her husband, his father, and the brother. And, and, and you got to remember, years before, 
when these boys were younger, Esau was not the man he became. He wasn't as wise. He was immature. He didn't value things. Have you ever known a teenager or a young adult who didn't value something that was valuable? They just didn't value it enough. And because of that, they wasted it or they, they, they made bad decisions. You ever known a young person to do that? Well, that was Esau when he was younger. He didn't value that birthright. I mean, he's like an 18-year-old who doesn't think saving for retirement matters. He'll wise up later, but right now it's not important to him. He doesn't value it. And so one day he sells his birthright, that double inheritance, to his brother Jacob. Man, dad's got decades to go. It's not going to be a big deal. And so he sells his birthright and he sells it cheap for basically a, a, a pot of lamb stew, if you will. And Jacob wasn't innocent in that because Jacob as a young man is a liar, a schemer, a deceiver, a con man. Neither of these boys, when they were young growing up, exercised real faith and character and Christ-likeness, godliness. So that had happened. And, and then as time passes and Esau wises up and realizes he'd made a really bad choice when he was younger, he begins regretting it and being bitter toward his brother for taking advantage of him. And now here we are, they're older a little bit and daddy's about to die and daddy Isaac wants to bless Esau. And what's going on? Mom and Jacob scheme to trick dad and steal the blessing from Esau. It's a long story, don't have time to go into all of it. But mom helps him with some food and some clothing, so he dresses up and puts stuff on him to make him smell like his brother Esau, and he changes his voice, and he goes into his feeble, elderly, dying, blind father and pretends to be his brother. And Isaac is a little bit suspicious, and he says, are you really Esau? And Jacob lies to his daddy's face. Now, <laughs> hey, we just had parent-child dedication. I'm going to break y'all's heart. Those beautiful little kids will become kids who occasionally lie to you, looking you straight in the face. <laughs> now, you don't think it's possible, but they will. All, all the grandparents in here say, yes, they will. And they'll do it with a straight face. But you see, Jacob, he's not a little kid. He's a young man. He's a man, and he's still doing it. And in Genesis 27, Genesis 27, Isaac pronounces on Jacob the blessing intended for Esau. And here's the thing you have to know in their culture, once you did it, you couldn't take it back. You couldn't take it back. So in Genesis 27 in verse 28, here's the blessing. Isaac speaks over Jacob thinking it's Esau. May God give you of the dew of the heaven and of the the, the, the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. Do you, do you know what he's doing? Isaac is saying to Jacob, God is going to make you the most successful, prosperous, wealthiest farmer around. Because they lived in an agricultural society. Your crops, your harvest are going to be great. You will be sustained. You'll have everything you need. You will have plenty but there's more to the blessing verse 29 may people serve you nations bow down to you you and your descendants will be powerful be master of your brothers your extended family you're the head of the home and may your mother's sons who are his mother's sons his brothers bow down to you Cursed be those who curse you. Blessed be those who bless you. Intending to give this to Esau. Instead, he gave it to Jacob. Jacob, you are going to be successful and wealthy as a farmer, as a rancher. And your descendants are going to be powerful. And your family will have to submit to your leadership. 
Not just your immediate family, your extended family. You're the head of the clan. That's their culture. Now, don't argue with it because our culture is different. That's theirs. Okay? When Isaac finds out he'd been lied to, he screams in anger. And when Esau comes home and finds out what had happened, how do you think he reacted? Look in chapter 27 at verse 37. Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him, Jacob, your younger brother, your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants. All the family, he's the head of the family grain and on he's going to be successful as a farmer and then Esau said to his father do you have only one blessing dad is there only one blessing you can give or do you have another do you have something for me and Esau lifted his voice and he wept he cried is there any blessing you can give me dad and in verse 39 Isaac his father answered and said to him behold Away from the fertility of the earth of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of the of heaven from above. In other words, you're not going to be a successful farmer. You're going to live a very different lifestyle. You're, going, you, you, you're not going to live here in in this fruitful land, the the promised land. Verse 40, by your sword you shall live and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. Remember, God had told Rebekah they would be two different nations, two different people groups. Jacob would become the patriarch of the Jewish people and nation. And Esau would move to the east, to the mountainous areas of Edom and become the father of the Edomites. And eventually become strong enough that he gained his independence from his brother. For more than two decades... Esau would hate Jacob with every fiber of his being. For more than two decades, Jacob would be afraid of Esau. But during those intervening years, the faith of their father Isaac and grandfather Abraham had taken seed in their hearts and lives and started to grow. And because they never totally turned their back on the faith, it grew and they changed. And eventually, after more than two decades, they reconciled. As Jacob repented and apologized and Esau forgave. And during their remaining lifetime, though they would live in two different places, they would live in harmony. And that's what faith does. And so here's the first point that I want you to really get, okay? Faith. Faith blesses. Listen. Faith blesses even dysfunctional families. Faith helps. Faith helps even families where there is dysfunction. Now, can we be honest? I got a little dysfunction in me. You got any dysfunction in you? If you say you don't, you're lying just like Jacob lied. Because there's not a perfect person in this room. Every family I've encountered, including my own, has some dysfunction in it, has some imperfections in it now let's just be honest some got more than others look to your neighbor and say you got more than me no don't do that don't do that but the truth is we all have it right and the encouraging thing from this story and remember over in Hebrews 11 they're listed in the faith hall of fame Jacob is listed there not because of who he was when he was young but who he became later because he Never let go of faith, and his faith grew. I'm glad 
that I don't have to be perfect and my family doesn't have to be perfect before God can honor my faith and, and do something in my life and do something in my family's life because as we saw a few weeks ago early in Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen for by it, the, you know, those in the past gained approval. And then he goes on to say that without faith, it is impossible to please God for the one who comes to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith, faith is always honored by God even when it's in people who are a little bit messed up. I mean, let me just ask you, how bad do you think it would have gotten if these two guys had had no faith? How bad would it have gotten if they had let go of the faith they had, even when it was weak? But because they didn't let go of it and they didn't quit and they, 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 they struggled, they, they, they worked through the hard stuff to become better men. better followers of God, better brothers. I'm not certain without faith, Jacob would have ever had the humility to, to apologize to his brother. I'm not sure without faith that Esau would never have had what it took to forgive him for all the things his brother had stolen from him. I tell young couples when we do premarital counseling that if you, if you, if you will continue to grow in Jesus you will become a better you which will make you a better husband or wife if you keep growing in Jesus and becoming more like Christ it's not just about religion it's not just about going to church there's people who go to church and they're jerks but a disciple of Jesus changes you become more like Jesus it's becoming Christ like and when that, when that happens you're a better spouse when that happens you're a better parent and the hope is listen the, the promise is the, the possibility is that if you keep growing in Jesus and becoming more like him down the road you're going to be better at all this stuff than you are now but without faith that's less likely to happen See, faith helps dysfunctional people and dysfunctional families. And I'm glad. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really glad. Well, I've got to jump ahead. I'm running out of time. Jump ahead. And now Jacob... He goes on and has 12 boys of his own. Makes the same mistake his dad and mom made, played favorites. His favorite was, jo was, was Joseph, second from the youngest of the 12. You ever, you, ever, you, ever, you ever known families that just handed down generation after generation bad habits? I mean, teachers see it all the time. Those who work in schools, they, they say it all the time. It's hard sometimes for children to overcome and change the stuff that mom and dad have drilled into them, the bad habits and, and so on. It's hard to break that sometimes. Can be broken. Takes a lot of work, a lot of faith. But Jacob played favorites just like, you know, his mom and dad had done. And it created problems. Joseph's brothers were so jealous of him. They got sick and tired of him. They couldn't stand him. They wanted to get rid of him. And one day, they're all out miles from home taking care of the family flock. And, and this is their opportunity. So they gang up on Joseph and they beat him up. And they sell him as a slave to a caravan passing by on its way to Egypt. And Joseph would be taken to Egypt as a slave where he would spend the rest of his life. He would live and die in Egypt. And it all started because Daddy Jacob did the same thing that Daddy Isaac and Mama Rebecca did. He played favorites with his kids. And I can hear some of you right now thinking, I mean, these are examples of faith. Yeah. Yeah. They are. But Joseph, who I think 
of these three characters was the greatest of faith. Because when he was a slave in Egypt, he ended up in, I mean, things were going pretty good. It was a slave, but it was going good, you know, as far as it can go for a slave. He was finding favor. Then he ends up in prison. Then he gets favor and then bad again. And it's a long story. But eventually God worked in Joseph because through all of his ups and downs, he never let go of his faith. He never gave up. He was consistent. He served God even when he didn't understand why things were happening the way they were until eventually God gave him favor and he was released from prison and he gained favor with the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he was elevated to a place of authority where he was second in command in the whole nation. But it took years to get there, years of being faithful. And now you jump ahead. Joseph's family, those brothers who sold him into slavery, his dad who thinks he's dead, they're all back in the promised land and they're about to starve to death because of severe famine and they hear there's food down in Egypt. So let's go down to Egypt and get some food and the whole clan moves down. Only to discover that Joseph is in charge of all the food in Egypt. <laughs> but the brothers have changed. See, that's what faith does. It changes you. And Joseph had been faithful the whole time. And they get down there and Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. And they cry, they cry, they cry, they apologize. He forgives. <laughs> Just like Jacob and Esau, now Joseph and his brothers. And it's all because they never let go of their faith. And jump ahead and... Jacob's now an old man like his dad Isaac had been. He's blind like his old dad Isaac had been. And it's time for him to give the blessing. And Joseph, his favorite son, takes his two boys in, Jacob's grandsons, to see their dying grandfather. And old Jacob rises up out of that bed and he places his hands over on, on those two little grand boys and he pronounces a blessing over them in chapter 28. And then, uh, or 20, 30, 20, somewhere in there in Genesis. <laughs> and in the next chapter, Jacob blesses all of his boys. Some of them more than others. That was their culture, remember. But he blesses all of them. So, just two things. One I've already said. God honors faith. Faith, faith will help you even when your family's not perfect. And it will help your family. How, how many of you ever feel like this? There have been times, and, and listen, the guys up top with the slides, they don't even know where I'm at. I've jumped this sermon around so much, they don't have a clue where I'm at. That's all right. You ever feel like, man, I wish I could go back and live my life again. Because if I did, I'd do some things different. As a pastor, sometimes I wish I, could, I wish I wish I knew at 30 and 35 as a pastor what I know today. But what about as a parent? If I could go back and raise my kids again to things that I would do different, hopefully better. Anybody ever think that, feel that? But life doesn't work that way, does it? Here's what I've learned. I didn't do it perfect the first time. If, I, if God let me go back and do it a second time, I still wouldn't do it perfect. <laughs> but if I have faith and I live with faith, somehow God honors it and he works through my dysfunction. He works through my imperfection and maybe doesn't accomplish everything he could, but he works through it and he accomplishes good anyway. And I thank God for that. Because if we have to be perfect and have no dysfunction before God can use us to bless our families, uh, there's no hope for any of us. So what's the takeaway for us? Don't let go of your faith. Grow in your faith. Struggle with it because that's a blessing to you and your family in spite of everything else. And then one last lesson real quick is faith causes us to moves us to bless our children and 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 grandchildren by seeing by catching glimpses 
of the future God has for them and telling them. Faith causes you to, to not look at your child just through your own selfish eyes, not just through the, their, their talents and gifts and say, wow, they could do this, they could do that. But faith, because your focus is on God, causes you to look at those children, those precious gifts from God, and, and through the eyes of God, see them the way he does and begin to see what God could do in their life. And maybe catch a glimpse of what God has for them. So in Hebrews 11, 20 and 21, when Isaac was blessing Jacob, that's what he was doing. And when he blessed Esau, he said, here's the future God has for you. And then later when Jacob blessed Joseph's grandsons, here's the blessing the future God has for you. And when he blessed his own sons, here's the future God has for you. You all know words are powerful, right? And it doesn't have to be just words of parents or family members. Uh, second time I ever preached, I was 17 years old, just turned 17. I was in my home church on a Sunday morning, Youth Sunday. And after the service, my French teacher from high school, Ann Weber, she also went to our church. And after I preached that Sunday, she came by, and we were standing about this area and uh, I still see her with her glasses. She had those, you know those rim glasses, those pointed ones on the end that people used to wear years ago? Remember those? And uh, Ann looked at me and she said, I think you found your calling. A prophetic word. I, still rem I can still see her. I still remember it. It was very affirming. And so many kids live in families where all they hear is put downs. You can't, you won't, you're no good, you're this. You ever thought about the destructive power of that kind of speech? You ever thought about the blessing? It is, and yeah, 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 sometimes we have to correct children. I know that. But to look at them through the eyes of God and see what could be, what God can do, because if God can take an untrustworthy, lying, you know what, like Jacob, and turn him into a great man of faith, there's hope for anybody and everybody. Amen. But do you see that in them? That God can do great things. And do you speak that to them? I think that's why Isaac and Jacob are listed in the Faith Hall of Fame. They spoke it to their kids. They spoke it to their kids. There's things I wish I could, I could unsay. But there's also things I'm glad I did say. And all I can do and all you can do is from this day forward, grow in our faith, hold on to our faith, and do it better going forward. And God will honor that. God will honor that. And I am so glad he does. Let's stand. We're going to sing. Pastors are coming to stand here at the front. And you are invited to make a decision for Jesus. If you feel the need to ask the Lord to forgive you for some things, kneel here at this altar and ask. Maybe because you are a person of faith, God has been speaking to you. And, and you know as a person of faith that that you need to apologize to someone or you need to forgive someone. Ask the Lord's help and do it. Do it. If you need to become a follower of Jesus or be baptized, come to a pastor and tell them. Come to this altar and pray. Holy Spirit is prompting you. Obey him as we sing together right now. Quickly, come on, just start walking right now, quickly. Quickly.